evoked potentials are also known as event related potential or evoked response there are various types of evoked potential depending on the stimulus where it is being given and what is being recorded so in any evoked potential we give a particular corresponding stimulus and uh, we record uh, from the primary receiving area for that sensory modality for example in visual evoked potential we give a visual stimulus we ask the person to sit in front of a screen and we put electrodes on the occipital area to record the eeg and then we find out the evoked response evoked response is the response which has been produced due to the stimulus okay similarly there is brain stem auditory evoked potential also known as brain stem evoked response audiometry in this auditory stimulus is given like clicks and response is made from the brain stem regions then there is somatosensory evoked potential somatosensory evoked potential the stimulus is basically electrical stimulation of a sensory nerve maybe median nerve or ulnar nerve in the upper limb and in lower limb also tibial nerve can be recorded and the recording is from the parietal cortex that is the somatosensory area there is another one in which motor stimulation is given so that is motor evoked potential in this stimulus is given to the motor cortex and the response is recorded from the muscle okay so these are the different types of evoked potentials now let us see some fundamentals basics about evoked potential recording so fundamentally what we are doing that we are putting electrodes on the scalp to record eeg activity so if this is the scalp of the person right here this is the person looking in front this is the scalp now eeg recording follows the placement of the electrodes by 1020 system okay in the system the circumference of the head is divided into two equal halves so what we do we measure the circumference from the front to the back and then we measure the lateral circumference also like this from preauricular area on one side to the preauricular area of the other side and then at the midpoint of those two circumference we mark one point okay so this is known as a central zero point cz and then finally on both the sides okay on both the sides the distances are divided into 20% 20% and 10% see this is fully 100% we have divided into 50% and further we will put the electrodes in this 50% in this 20% region 20% region and finally in 10% region so these are the areas where electrodes are put now this way whole scalp is covered with the electrodes so with this we record the eeg activity of the brain when we are recording evoked response in that case we provide a stimulus to the person and then there is evoked response now the problem is that the background eeg activity is up to 300 microvolt in amplitude however evoked response is very small it is only 0.1 to 10 microvolts so that means that if this is the eeg activity routine eeg activity from the brain it is being recorded then even if you are giving the stimulus evoked response will somewhere be in between and we will not be able to identify which is the evoked response so we have to do something known as averaging okay so we provide the stimulus many times these are known as the trials of the stimulus and we keep on averaging the response that means that uh, with each stimulus these all are average that means there is summing up of all these response there is cancelling out of all these response i can say because this response the normal eeg activity it is in varied direction so if we sum up ultimately it will cancel out each other however because the evoked response is consistent with each stimulus it will happen in the same direction every time so when it is being summed up it will become more prominent while rest the background eeg activity it will be cancelled out so this is known as averaging and this is the fundamental which is used to record any type of evoked potential now there are certain general indications for all types of sensory evoked potentials this is to determine the depth of anesthesia it is also used for intraoperative neural monitoring that means when the operation is going on 
for a particular structure in the spinal cord or in the brain in that case we monitor these evoked potential and during monitoring we should ensure that these evoked potentials do not become distorted for example the waves are not lost during the operation then it is also used to determine the functional loss for example determining the hearing level in an infant who cannot respond so we can determine whether there is a intact auditory pathway for the infant now moving on to specific evoked potential that is visual evoked potential so in visual evoked potential recording this is the stimulus which is commonly used this is known as pattern reversal checkerboard so what we are doing is so you see that there is a pattern reversal of white and black patterns the person is made to sit at a distance of 1 meter from this checkerboard and one eye is stimulated at a time so one eye is closed and the person is asked to target on the central portion of this checkerboard and there is pattern reversal of this at approximately 2 per second so every 500 millisecond this pattern is changing there can be other stimulus as well that is flash of light can be given and then evoked response can be monitored another is hemi field stimulation which is not very commonly used so we are mainly talking about this pattern reversal checkerboard uh, stimulus which is commonly used then for recording the recording electrodes are placed on the scalp in the oz area so this cz area we discuss that is the central zero point then we divide behind into 20 20 and the 10th division okay so last one is the occipital zero electrode so one electrode is kept at oz area then 5 to 7 cm just on the left and right side of that in the parasagittal regions o1 and o2 are placed okay so we have left occipital recording right occipital recording and then we create montages montages is basically the combination of the electrodes which are recorded okay so right occipital with mid frontal that is frontal is the fz electrode so i am not going into the details of all the electrodes of the eg right but um, this fz electrode is placed in the frontal region so we see the potential difference recording between the right occipital electrode and the mid frontal electrode so this is known as one montage then we see the potential difference between the left occipital electrode and mf electrode mid frontal electrode and then third montage is midline occipital that is the oz electrode and the mid frontal electrodes so with the stimulation eg recording is seen in these three montages so what is the recording which is obtained after averaging so this is the typical recording which is obtained here we have three different waves that is n70 wave p100 wave and n145 wave so the nomenclature is like this n means a negative wave and by convention in this recording a wave going up is known as a negative wave though it appears positive by convention it is known as a negative wave okay and 70 means that it appears 70 millisecond from the stimulus so that much time is there between the appearance of the wave and the stimulus p100 similarly means positive wave seen at 100 milliseconds and n145 means a negative wave seen at 145 milliseconds from the stimulus okay now these are not fixed exactly they won't appear at 100 millisecond or 70 millisecond so you will see that different terms also somewhere it might be given n75 or n140 however p100 is the one which is commonly used for interpretation and p100 denotes the electrical correlate of activity of primary visual cortex so what is happening that when we are stimulating one particular eye so full visual field of one eye is being stimulated by this checkerboard pattern now that means the information from this eye why are the nasal fibers and why are the temporal fibers of the optic nerve are reaching to the cortex and if we do obtain p100 correctly that means this visual pathway is completely intact okay so what is this vp checking it is checking the integrity of the visual pathway and we have to mainly note the latency and amplitude of this p100 
any latency which is more than 116 milliseconds it is considered abnormal and when we stimulate different eyes we record from the right eye we record from the left eye if there is a difference in the p100 from both the eyes that is inter eye difference if that difference is more than 6 milliseconds then also it is considered as abnormal now there are various stimulus factors also which affect the p100 latency and amplitude so i'm not going into the details of that but we should remember that uh, these stimulus factors need to be controlled properly to get proper p100 latency and amplitude for example they can be increased p100 latency if the pattern reversal rate of the checkerboard stimulus is faster if the luminance is lower or the size of the checks which are there they are smaller contrast is also lower so in that case p100 latency which we will obtain it will be more so we have to be careful that these stimulus factors are consistent as required otherwise the interpretation will become difficult amplitude also amplitude of this p100 can be lower in case of low luminance low contrast or in case larger field sizes is stimulated now what are the indications of visual evoked potential and how it is interpreted in case we are doing visual evoked potential to find the presence of any disease and we find that yes p100 latency has increased then remember generally it has interpreted as a problem in anterior visual pathway disorders anterior visual pathway disorder generally posterior visual pathway disorder they are better assessed by ct and mri right or another cause of abnormal visual evoked potential is functional visual loss functional visual loss is decrease in the visual acuity without any organic lesion okay so these are the two major interpretations of abnormal visual evoked potential anterior visual pathway disorder generally in multiple sclerosis when there is optic neuritis this uh, p100 latency is prolonged okay then it is also used to assess visual acuity in non-verbal infants and also in malingerers because in malingerers even if the person is saying that there is visual loss vp will be normal okay similarly in non-verbal infants we can analyze the intactness of the visual pathway by doing vp then it is used for intraoperative neural monitoring for example in case of surgeries of optic glioma meningioma in region of optic nerve craniopharyngioma this vp can be monitored and uh, during the monitoring of vp there should be no loss of the waves or increased latency of p100 so that was all about visual evoked potential thanks for watching the video if you liked it do press the like button share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel physiology open